For more, I want to bring in Dr. Jonathan Metzl, the professor of psychiatry at Vanderbilt University. He writes about the history of stand your ground laws and racial stereotyping in his book, Dying of Whiteness. Doctor, thanks for being here. We're talking about what should be harmless mistakes, wrong doorbell, wrong driveway, wrong car, and yet we've seen lethal consequences. Help us make sense of this, how pulling the trigger has become what seems like a knee-jerk reaction for some people. Well, I think that's absolutely right. These are absolutely everyday occurrences. People, I mean, my coming over here today, the three cars pulled up for the Uber and they were all the same car. I didn't know quite which one to get into. These kind of things happen every day. But what we're seeing is the logical extension of really beyond permissive gun laws. We used to have laws in this country that basically said you can use lethal force only if somebody breaks into your home, and even then you have a duty to retreat, to limit uh, violence. Um, but what we've seen with these stand your ground laws, which have become increasingly common, I think over 30 states have them now, is not only that people have the right to step forward, not to retreat, to step forward. More people have guns, more people are afraid. And really what we're seeing now is the logical consequence of an increasingly armed society and people who are really taught by these laws and by uh, media and the NRA and other places to shoot first and ask questions later. The whole self-defense argument may come into play in one or more of these recent cases. We were just showing a map of the country and all of those, those states shaded in yellow, more than two dozen states right now have some form of a stand your ground law or something very similar. You argue that there's something fundamentally concerning about how these laws may impact human behavior. Absolutely. I mean, I think people are trained to see other people as threats, and also you don't know who else has a gun. I think the important other thing for people to know about these laws is that the onus is on the prosecutor in a case like this. That'll be the case in Missouri and other places. In other words, the person who shoots somebody else says, I felt threatened, I felt somebody was, was um, you know, breaking into my home or attacking me. It's all about the perception of violence. And then a prosecutor has to disprove that. And so what we see is that these cases are very often frequently defended, um, you know, oh, yeah, you felt defended, you felt uh, helpless, you felt like you were under attack. And so I think the issue is the entire legal system is set up now in these states, not only to protect people who shoot other people, but also to give them the benefit of the doubt. And what we see are cases like this. We also see racially disparate outcomes where white people who shoot other people are more often called justifiable shooting, whereas black Americans who shoot people are, are brought up on criminal charges. So there are so many problems with these standard ground laws. We really have to rethink them, I think, very broadly. And so what is the answer? Because I, I correct me if I'm wrong, you're not saying people shouldn't be able to defend themselves when there is a threat, right? But where is that line? Well, we've had that line. In other words, we had, we've had decades of law in this country that say if somebody breaks into your home, um, you have a right. Uh, even the 2008 uh, Supreme Court case that said basically people have a right to keep guns in their home, particularly for this exact reason. Uh, but what we've seen is a, really a perversion of that. We had something called the Castle Doctrine before, which was kind of the common policy. A man's home is his castle. And now it's kind of like there's a bubble around you wherever you go, so you should take your gun. So Castle Doctrine was expanded understand your ground to your you have a right in your car when you're going on public transportation when you're walking around and so really I think the best thing to do would be to walk back this just real perversion of, of what's been established law um, just walk back what we've done over the past 10 years and I think we're going to see fewer of these kind of cases going back to the case in Missouri where Maggie was the Kansas City Star spoke to the grandson of Andrew Lester who's charged with shooting Ralph Yarl that's the the 16-year-old who rang the doorbell at the wrong house. The grandson of that alleged shooter says his grandfather has been immersed in conspiracies and disinformation in recent years and living in a, quote, new cycle of fear and paranoia. I wonder how can consuming disinformation influence people's behavior? Well, generally, I argue that I try not to comment on a case where I haven't actually spoke to the person or interviewed the person. But in this case, I think that those 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 examples from what the what the grandson was saying are particularly important. I mean, in a way, this this man appears to be a, the poster child or the poster grandfather for somebody who's radicalized by right wing media, by NRA messages, by this idea that basically you're under threat and everybody is out to get you and take your stuff. And so, really, I think that those comments, if they if they uh, turn out to be true and they play out at trial, I think speak to the ways in which particularly vulnerable people are 
very sensitive to this message that everybody's after you and really that's why you need a gun to protect yourself. I really appreciate your expertise and, and sharing your knowledge and understanding the psychology involved here and the background of these stand your ground laws. Jonathan Metzl, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks.